Praise the Lord and uh, welcome everyone to class this morning. I hope you all had a blessed week and uh, and you're ready to uh, enjoy our class this morning. Uh, before we continue in looking at uh, and studying uh, this publication, Receiving God's Guidance for Our Life, we'll just pause for a word of prayer. Can uh, one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Gracious, loving, heavenly Father, God, we praise and thank you for this morning time, O Lord God. You have graciously given us this time to learn, O Lord God, from the word, O Lord God, and Lord, help us, O Lord, uh, to be... Lord, diligent in listening and also practicing it in our lives. So, Father, God bless our uh, pastor who is teaching us and give us the mind and the thoughts. So, Lord, take control, Lord God, so that we can meditate. And, Lord God, be blessed for this day, O Lord. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise. For we ask all this in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Esther Clement. Um, so last Friday, we began studying uh, the other APC publication, uh, Receiving God's Guidance. We looked at chapter one, uh, where we saw how God desires to uh, guide us in every area of our life, whether it is um, a small matter or a big matter. And we have this wonderful privilege to have God as our um, guide and we also see that God is genuinely interested in leading us and guiding us even as we make decisions in our lives and also the word of God says that God promises to guide us in every step of the way that we go or every phase of our journey in life. So we looked at various scripture passages and we learned various things. We also looked at um, the basis to understand God's will. So we looked at some of the basis to understand God's will. And then we looked at, um, you know, whether there are three categories of God's will, as we read Romans chapter 12, verse 1 to 2, and we said, no, there are no three different categories, but God's will is good, pleasing, and acceptable all the time. And um, then we looked at our responsibility. God is uh, God desires to, uh, you know, guide us and lead us every step of the way, but, um, uh, you know, and he also promises to lead us and guide us, but what is our responsibility? And we looked at three things. We must seek God, we must listen to him, and we must obey him. Okay, so that is what we looked at chapter one. And then we moved on to chapter two, where we looked at specifically the life of David, uh, because unlike any other uh, man in the Bible, you know, David uh, at every stage of his life, you know, inquired of uh, God. And we know that he was a man after God's own heart. And he was somebody who was willing to do uh, God's will. And um, um, we read in uh, Acts chapter 13, verse 36, that, you know, um, David served uh, God in his own generation by the will of God. Uh, so we saw that, you know, he was able to do this because, you know, throughout his life, at every stage of his life, he inquired of the Lord or he asked God what he needs to do. So even as we look at um, a few of uh, the phases in uh, David's life uh, and how he inquired from God, uh, we can also learn uh, in our own uh, life's journey, you know, uh, where are the different areas or stages or um, times in our life when we need to uh, inquire of the Lord. So the first thing we looked at was uh, in First Samuel chapter 23 verses 1 to 5. And we learned that, you know, when our own team hesitates to take uh, on our plans, our decisions, our suggestions uh, of what we hear from God, uh, what we need to do. Um, just like David, he inquired of the Lord and when he did what God asked him to do and he won the victory, his uh, own team members, or his his uh, his group of men you know, realized that um, here was somebody who 
hears from God, inquires from God, hears from God, and does what God uh, asked them to do. And uh, they had this confidence um, in following their um, leader. So even as um, we do this in life, you know, at various points in our life, whether you're a leader of the church, you're a leader of a prayer group or a, a ministry group, or uh, in the workplace, wherever you are, or at home, even as you lead your family and guide them, you know, there are various times when people along uh, in you, with you in the team will not agree uh, to what you're saying. They think that the plan what you're doing uh, or the plan or your strategy is not the right plan not the right strategy um, but we see that you know David tells his men and they were they were hesitant to take on uh, his plan or go and fight um, the battle but David goes back and inquires of the Lord and um, uh, we see that uh, God tells him to go and fight the battle and he will surely win the battle and um, uh, we see that when he does that you know, um, and they win the battle, his teammates, um, uh, it's like a confidence booster for them. You know, they are excited and they know that their leader is um, uh, inquiring from the uh, Lord. Uh, the next thing we saw was, you know, um, when uh, David faced severe uh, setback, even when his, uh, you know, he he lost his wives, his children, everything, his his uh, group of men, they lost everything, um, and um, they were so disappointed, so discouraged, and they were all uh, weeping and mourning, and they also his men, uh, you know, thought of um, harming David, and we see that at that time, you know, um, what does David do? You know, he first strengthens himself in the Lord, his God. So he finds strength for himself in his situation because he himself has lost his wife and his children. And uh, once he strengthened uh, himself in the Lord, his God, I don't know how he did that. Maybe he would have just prayed to God, cried out to God, worshipped God, just, you know, loved God, uh, shown his love to God. And uh, when he did that, we see that... Um, you know, and he inquired of God, God told him what to do. And uh, he and his men were able to uh, uh, retrieve back or get back everything that they had um, lost. So also we learn that, you know, when we go through um, uh, severe setbacks in our life, when we go through disappointments, frustrations, um, difficult situations, what do we need to do? You know, um, we need to first strengthen ourselves in the Lord, our God, okay? Just worship God, just pray, just pour out your heart to God, cry out to Him, and, um, you know, just pour out your love, um, and then inquire of the Lord, and the Lord will lead us and guide us um, how to overcome the setback, how to uh, conquer our giants, how to uh, bring about victory and success in the area where you are facing a setback. Okay, and the next thing uh, we uh, we will look at is um, you know um, when we are going through transitions in life and you know different seasons in life and we are moving out from one season we are going to another season uh, we are transitioning from one. Uh, you know, journey in life, we're going to another, uh, stepping into another season or another journey in life, you know, uh, what do we need to do? So uh, we um, we can draw out some lessons from the life of David in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. Uh, we already looked at it um, uh, two weeks back when we were studying the publication, Fulfilling God's Purpose for Your Life. And um, we looked at this specific passage, and I already have um, uh, explained that for us, but I'll just uh, reiterate a few points here. Um, we see that, you know, uh, David was running for his life. He was hiding from uh, King Saul. So he was running from place to place because Saul was, King Saul was behind him uh, to, to catch David and to um, put an end to his life. And suddenly, you know, things change when uh, David receives news that uh, King Saul has died. Now, uh, you know, David could have continued to stay in the in the wilderness, in the jungle, you know, uh, just enjoying um, his life in the open space, uh, like Jungle Book, you know, just uh, 
um, uh, we, he and his men just being there because they knew the terrain, they knew the uh, environment, the area. They could have just uh, and continued living there. And if they did, we we I, I I mentioned to you that you know David would not have come into his role, his assignment, his divine destiny, and the purpose that God had um, for his um, life. But we see that you know instead of making himself uh, comfortable with where he was and continuing on from there and uh, he uh, inquires of God he asks God God you know King Saul is dead now should um, you know um, what should I do should I move to any one of the cities of Judah and so we see that you know God tells him um, yes David go to Hebron so when he goes to Hebron we see that you know uh, David um, uh, uh, the, the people of Judah in um, Hebron, you know, they come to David and they anoint him as uh, king. So we see that seven and a half years after, uh, you know, uh, 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 seven and a half years later, as David was in Hebron, uh, the leaders of the entire nation of Israel, uh, you know, uh, uh, asked him to be king over uh, Israel. Okay. So we see that. Uh, what did David do when he knew that King Saul had died? He did not say, okay, you know, I've already been appointed as king, so I'm going to go and uh, to the palace and take my position. But he inquires of God. You know, he could have acted in a way that he was confident, he knew what he was supposed to do because here was a king who's dead and now he was sure that he's the next king and so he can go and take his authority and his position as king, but he inquires of God and God tells him where to go and what to do. And we see that he goes to Hebron and when he goes to Hebron, it's only the, uh, you know, the people of Judah who anoint uh, David as their um, king. But, you know, David is not disappointed or angry. Uh, he just is obeying God. He's just doing what God is asking him to do at that stage in his life. And we see that seven and a half years later, you know, the, the entire people of Israel uh, make him, uh, the leaders come to him and ask him to be king over all Israel. So even as we journey in life and there are li different life transitions, like we move out from being you know, students in school to entering into college life, into career life, um, you know, um, work life, married life, family life, being parents, um, you know, old age. Uh, these are different life transitions or, you know, journeys or seasons that we uh, make. And um, we need to ask God's guidance, you know, um, uh, under God's guidance, we need to position ourselves. And then when we do that, you know, we will be able to fulfill all that God has appointed for our lives in that season, in that life transition. Okay. So not just going through life and journeying through life and say, okay, this is come. I'll just do this. I'll just do this. This is what, um, you know, uh, my uh, father has done. My grandfather has done. This is what people have done before. So I just do the same normal thing. But, you know, if we want to uh, come to that place or position ourselves to fulfilling um, God's purpose for our life, uh, uh, our appointed life in that season, we need to, um, you know, uh, ask God and wait for his leading and guidance. Okay. So that is what uh, 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 David did when he transitioned uh, from one phase of his life to the other phase of his life. Okay. Now we look at another example from the life of David in uh, 2 Samuel uh, chapter 5, verses 17 uh, to 25. Um, so can somebody read that, please? Um, 2 Samuel chapter 5, verses 17 to 25. Hello. Second Samuel chapter 5, verse 17 to 25. Now, when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David. And David heard of it and went down to the stronghold. The Philistines also went and deployed themselves 
in the valley of Rephaim. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into your hand. So David went to Baal Perazim, <clears throat> and David debated them there. And he said, The Lord has broken through my enemies before me, like a breakthrough of water. Therefore he called the name of that place Baal Perazim. And they left their image there, and David and his men carried them away. Then the Philistines went up once again and deployed themselves in the valley of Rephaim. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, and he said, You shall not go up, circle around behind them, and come up upon them in front of the mulberry trees. And it shall be, when you hear the sound of marching into the tops of the mulberry trees, then you shall advance quickly. For then the Lord will go out before you to strike the camp of the Philistines. And David did so, as the Lord commanded him, and he drove back the Philistines from Geba as far as Gezer. Thank you. So here we uh, see in this passage that, uh, you know, when David was anointed as king over all Israel, uh, the Philistines come to fight against uh, David. And uh, uh, David then, you know, inquires of the Lord. So we see that David could have acted uh, very confident because he had uh, 400 strong men um, who were, uh, you know, good, strong warriors. He could have just gone up and fought against them um, because now he was king over all his trial. He had more men, more people who could, uh, you know, be part of his army. But he inquires of the Lord and asks God, shall I go up against the Philistines? And God says, go up, you know. And so he goes. And what happens? What happens when he goes? Do they win the battle or they lose the battle? They win the battle. Thank you, Gertrude. So they win the battle. And we see that the Philistines are not, um, you know, happy with the uh, with the loss. They come back to fight with David the second time. Now, what does David do the second time? What does David do the second time? He inquires of the Lord. Yes, he goes back and inquires from the Lord. We see that, you know, he doesn't say, okay, it's the same enemy. You know, I've already defeated them once before. And anyway, God has said, you know, I'm going that you will win the battle, which means he would mean it even for the second time. But we see that David does not act in, uh, uh, you know, he doesn't act overconfident uh, and he's not just going with his own strength, his own wisdom. But we see that David inquires of the Lord. And this time, this, does God just tell him, go, you know, I will give you... Um, um, uh, you know, I will give and promise victory. What does they, does God do that? Does he just say, okay, go like the last time and I will give you victory? No, yes, thank no, you. Says, go in circle. Yes, it so this instructions. Yes, thank you. So this time he doesn't just say, go, I'm going to give you victory, but this time there is a different strategy because. God knows that it's the same enemy, but the same enemy has come back more aggressive with, you know, uh, good plans, a good strategy to win against uh, David. And so, you know, God tells David what to do. So he says, you need to circle. Um, uh, you shall not go up, but that means you don't fight against them directly. He says, circle around behind them and come up. Uh, uh, in front of the mulberry trees and he says when you hear the sound of marching on top of the mulberry trees now how can you know some how can an army march on top of a tree you know nobody can march on top of a tree it's 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 impossible so what god is actually saying is he's going to send his angelic host the angelic army uh, to fight this battle for uh, David and that is why he says you know when you hear the noise of marching on top of the mulberry tree 
you know nobody can uh, no human being uh, or no human beings can march on top of that mulberry tree that you know, they just can't do it it's impossible so it's basically god you know giving a different strategy and telling him that you know it is the angelic armies or the heavenly armies is going to come and um, uh, back him up and fight this um, battle what would have happened if david would not have inquired um, of the lord you know do you think he would have lost this battle yes thank you thank you sunny moses uh, yes he would have thank you lucy he would have surely lost the battle why because this time the battle was too strong um, and uh, god knew that david could not and his men could not um, uh, you know fight against the israelites they needed the angelic um, or the heavenly armies to fight against um, them okay so what do we learn from this you know we also have an enemy do you all have an enemy your enemy is not your uh, boss or your husband or your spouse uh, you know who is or your neighbor who is who you constantly you know against you who is your enemy satan satan yes thank you so satan is our enemy and god has given us the weapons for our warfare okay to fight against uh, our enemy what are some of the weapons of our warfare that god has given us for a spiritual battle yes for the spiritual uh, thank you lucy it's god's word what else by the bible yes a uh, helmet of salvation okay is given us worship praise and worship is given us uh, uh, the name of god Ma. blood of jesus us, yes thank you the blood of jesus is given us uh, so important the name of jesus so we have all of these um, weapons that god has um, given us and these weapons are mighty so when we engage our enemy sometimes we can be confident in saying hey god has given us these weapons just go out and 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 just use it but you know uh, we need to also inquire of god god what is the strategy that i need to use at this time even as i know that the enemy is coming against me and i know the enemy is all out to steal kill and destroy my life what is the even as you've given me these um, uh, weapons that are mighty uh, god what is the strategy that i need to use so we need to listen from god receive the strategy and then when we use the right strategy uh, uh, against our enemy at that situation you know we will see um, uh, 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 we will see a victory we'll be able to resist and nullify the enemy so sometimes we can think that hey i'm fighting up my enemy uh, i'm using all the weapons god has given me but nothing seems to work why you know because we need to ask god and uh, because we need to know what is the right strategy because our enemy also knows the weapons that we have he's smarter you know and he's very smart and he's very um uh you know um, sly in that way so he knows everything so we need to be even more smarter and we have the wisdom of god we have the the word of god we also have god's guidance and the holy spirit to guide us and lead us what is the right strategy uh to use um, in our battle against our uh, enemy so god will teach us how we need to fight what uh, strategy we need to use how we need to stand firm and how we can walk in dominion over the defeated uh, foe okay now when in life when we journey through life you know sometimes things might just keep going wrong for no apparent reason i mean you can't think of a reason why things are going wrong one after the other you're trying to one uh, understand you're trying to reason um, so lo let's look at the life of david and uh, learn what we can uh, do when we go through you know times when you know everything seems to be going wrong for no apparent reason so in second samuel chapter 21 verse 1 we read what uh, david does when he goes through um, a problem or a difficulty which is you know for no reason has just come up uh, so can somebody please read second samuel chapter 21 verse 1 please now there was a 
famine in the days of David for three years, year after year, and David inquired of the Lord. And the Lord answered, It is because of Saul and his bloodthirsty house, because he killed the Gibeonites. Amen. Thank you. So here there was a famine in the land, and the famine was for you know for uh, uh, for three years, and you know finally David was might have thought exhausted all his resources and thinking why is this famine? He would have done things to set things right. His own life, his family, his um, you know him as a king, but nothing seems to be working. So finally he inquires of the Lord. And the Lord tells him why this famine was, was because of what King Saul had um, done. King Saul, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, attacked the Gibeonites, um, uh, and he shouldn't have done it because Israel had promised to uh, protect the Gibeonites, and they broke that promise. And so we see that, you know, uh, in David's time, the people of Israel were suffering because of what King Saul had um, done. And so when David inquires the Lord, the Lord tells him, and what does he do? He repents and he restores all the things that have been taken away with the Gibeonites and immediately the famine stops. So we see that, you know, when we go through life, um, and there are things that just keeps going wrong and you're not able to understand why uh, everything is going wrong, you know, um, need to ask God. And when he asks God, listen to him, God will speak his counsel. And when we hear his counsel, his direction, you know, we need to take action and see, and then we will see change and we will see God moving and um, helping us and helping us overcome um, uh, whatever uh, is going wrong in our lives. So these are a few ways that, you know, David inquired of the Lord, um, you know, and that's why he was able to fulfill the will of God in his lifetime, because he sought and received God's guidance throughout every season or transition or in his um, life. Okay, so we don't know uh, all the details of how David inquired the Lord, but, you know, um, God would have spoken to him through uh, the uh, revelation by the Spirit, Holy Spirit, through dreams, uh, through the prophets, uh, also to the Urim and the Tumim that they used to inquire the, uh, you know, uh, a, a time of, uh, from the time of Joshua right up to the time of David. So we see that, you know, he would have used the Urim and Tumim uh, to, uh, to receive God's guidance. and um, But we see that he was a man who consistently inquired of God and he was God was able to lead him and guide him and he was able to do exactly what God's will was for his um, life. And hence he fulfilled the plan and purpose that God had for his life and that is why he is known uh, as a man after God's own heart. So if we want to move through life um, and uh, get help in different seasons, different transition times, you know, um, or even as we engage our enemy, it's important for us to receive God's guidance and inquire of him. Okay, so that is lesson two. Uh, anyone has any questions, any doubts, anything you'd like to ask? Ma'am, how can we treat it as a punishment or a curse of Saul's disobedience on the Israelites? Uh, how can we treat it as a punishment or a curse? Uh, it was basically that, you know, the, uh, the Gibeonites, you're talking about the Gibeonites, right, Lucy? So you're asking, uh, why were the Israelites punished for Saul's sin? Or why was David punished for Saul's sin? That's what are you asking? Yes, sister. Yes, sister. Okay. Yes. So uh, basically we see in the Old Testament that, you know, uh, the sins are passed on from one generation to an, uh, another generation. Um, uh, we don't know uh, why, you know, God brought it about in, in David's time. But uh, just thinking about, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, 
in 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 my context or in the the way that uh, we operate you know god would not have brought it about during saul's time this punishment of famine because you know the spirit of god was not on saul you know um uh, we know that when saul disobeyed god the spirit of god left him so um God knew that if he, if he bought the famine on uh, the people of Israel, the people of Israel would suffer unnecessary for one man's, uh, uh, you know, uh, one man's foolishness and what he had done. Okay, so uh, why do the people have to suffer? So he, and yes, there had to be restoration that had to be done. There had to be compensation for what had to be done to the Gibeonites. The Gibeonites were wrong when the Israelites had to keep their promise of protecting them or being friends with them. Uh, but if it happened in Saul's time, Saul would never have inquired of the Lord. You know, he would never have done that. And God would never have spoken to him. And unnecessarily, the people of Israel, innocent people had to suffer. So he he had to make about a restoration and he had to punish that sin. And so he brought it about David's time because he knew, I think, that David was somebody who would inquire of the Lord. And when he inquires, God would show him and tell him and David would obey God, he would make that restoration. He would go back and restore things with the Gibeonites and things would have achieved God's plan and purpose in restoring that uh, friendship and relationship with the Gibeonites. And also, you know, uh, things would have been set right. So I think in just yes, my sister. understanding. Yes, yeah. Sister. Thank you. Thank you, sister. Yes. Yeah. Anyone else has any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, we'll move on to chapter 3. Okay, um, now how does God lead us and guide us? There are many ways that God leads us and guides us, but two important primary ways that God leads us and guides us. To, does anyone know? The two primary ways that God leads us and guides us? What are the two primary ways? Okay, the word of God. Thank you, Shaker. Okay, yeah, his word. And the other one, second one. Oh, the Holy Spirit. Thank you, uh, John. So it's the word of God and it's the Holy Spirit are the two primary ways that God leads us and um, guides us. And scripture is the most important way, you know, to uh, for us to know or determine what is right in God's eyes, what is his will, uh, what he's asking us to do, how we're, how he's guiding us and how he is um, leading us. So we look at how, you know, um, uh, uh, God leads us and guides us through his uh, script, His word. So let's just consider a few scriptures and understand, you know, how God leads us and guides us. Psalm 119 verse 105 says, uh, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So the psalmist is basically saying that, you know, um, God's word is like that torchlight, you know, when there is darkness around us and we want to find our way, um, you know, what do we do? We, you know, put the torchlight on uh, or we get a candle or, you know, use our mobile, uh, 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 you know, the light there and, uh, you know, we kind of walk. So it's the, to it's the torchlight that gives us um, the confidence to take the second step and the third step and the fourth step. The same way, you know, God uh, guides us through various um, steps that we take in life, through our journey in life, he shows us the path we need to uh, take. Okay, the same Psalm, Psalm 119, verse 130. Can somebody read that, please? The entrance of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Amen. So God... God's word enlightens us. It gives us light, understanding, and wisdom. So what did, uh, does it mean? Now, you know, when you enter into a room and it's pitch dark, you know, it's total darkness, um, and somebody says, hey, enter that room. There are some ex wonderful things 
uh, great things in store for you there. Just enjoy everything in the room. And you enter in and there is pitch darkness. You can't see a thing, you know. And what do you do? You know, what do you do when there's pitch darkness in the room? And you want to see what is, you know, the exciting things that are waiting in store for you. You put on the light or, you know, you turn on the torch light or you, you know, just get that room uh, bright and once the room is bright you're everything you know you're able to see everything you're able to enjoy everything you know then makes sense in the same way when we go through life there are times when there is you know when we when we're journeying in life there are times when we come to a place where you know we're not able to understand what is happening in our life we don't know what um, uh, uh, decision to make you know the situation that we are in Things just don't make a sense. And, um, you know, in those times, it's God's word that enlightens us. How does God's word enlightens us? At those times, we need to spend more time just reading his word, just feeding on his word, just, you know, meditating on his word. And then we'll be able to understand and, uh, and God speaks to us through his word then we are able to make sense of the situation that we are in. We are able to see and understand, um, you know, God's purposes. Um, uh, you know, God's word enlightens us. We are able to see and understand God's purpose, the meaning, the direction, and the situation that we are in. Uh, you know, we receive wisdom. We, we receive understanding on what to do, how to do things, and how to move ahead. Okay. Uh, so that is Psalm 119, verse 130. Let's look at another scripture passage, uh, Psalm 37, verse 31. Can somebody read that, please? The law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. So it's talking about a person, you know, when God's word is in their heart, what happens? You know, God establishes our steps he makes our step firm and secure and we will never stumble or uh, fall you know because when we walk guided by god's word every step we take will be very strong and bold and um, solid so our steps are ordered by god through his word and when we take those steps we can be unshakable and we are on a strong firm foundation Okay, so here, uh, you know, we look at some common ways that God speaks and leads and guides us through his written word. The first thing is, you know, God leads and guides us through the instruction in God's word. Can somebody please read 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 15 to 17, please? All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Amen. Thank you. So here it says, what of scripture, only New Testament or Paul's letters or some scripture or Old Testament is given by inspiration of God? Which part of scripture is given by the inspiration of God? All scripture, both Old and New Testament. Amen. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Lucy. So it says all scripture. Okay. So which means we need to be familiar with all of scripture. We need to be familiar with the Old Testament. We need to be familiar with the New Testament, with Paul's letters, with the, you know, the synoptic gospels. We need to be familiar with um, the book of Revelation, uh, poetic literature, you know, Proverbs, whatever it is, you know, every part of scripture we need to be familiar with and not just choose some parts of uh, scripture. Why? Because, you know, when um, we need to know something in life, sometimes, you know, we go to a passage of scripture and we can misinterpret it or misunderstand it. But we also, we need to interpret scripture in the light of the rest of scripture so you're looking at a passage in script 
in the Bible, you're reading it, you're trying to understand it. You can't just read it and understand what is there just like that. You need to look at it in the light of God's nature, what he's revealed about himself, and the light of the rest of scripture. And when we do that, you know, um, we, uh, we gain more wisdom, we gain more understanding. And also we gain uh, wisdom and understanding on what God has um, spoken to us about various areas of our life from scripture okay so if you look at the word of god i don't know if you have experienced it but you know i can say more than you know 100 percent more than that that every area of my life any problem any difficulty any um uh you know uh, doubt i have every answer is there in scripture you know you don't have to go to anyone to ask them I sometimes I think even the silliest thing, the smallest thing, the biggest thing, uh, something we think, hey, can this be in scripture? I'm going through this problem. Can the Bible tell me anything about it? Well, everything is there in scripture. It's God's word. It's what he's revealed to us. It is his heart. And he knows the areas that we are going through. This, we will go through struggles and challenges every part of our life, every situation, every difficulty, every answer you need is there in scripture. So, you know, um, every instruction is there. And all we need to do is just read God's word, meditate, uh, you know, and then just obey it. OK. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, for example, you know, you don't even have to. Sometimes we are running to people and asking them for obvious uh, answers for our, uh, the solutions or difficulties or the stages in life that we are going through when it's already given in, 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 in the word of God. So, you know, every area or stage in our life that we go through, everything, uh, there are directions, there are instructions that are there in the word of god so i'll give you an example if you're saying hey i've been forgiving my spouse or my child or you know my boss or my colleague or somebody in my family it's now i've done it umpteen number of times i've done it 10 times god do you still want me to forgive them so you don't have to go and run to a pastor or a prophet to ask them this you know it's already given in the bible that god asks us to forgive somebody 70 times 7 that means countless times you know, you can't ask the God, you know, my uh, my spouse is being very difficult. Should I love him or her? You know, the word of God just says you have to love your spouse. You know, you, you're saying that your spouse is very difficult. Uh, you know, I can't submit. I can't obey. But the word of God says submit, obey. Children, you know, um, we all have parents and we some of our you know, parents can be difficult. None of them are perfect. We're saying, you know, uh, should I obey my parents? Should I respect them, honor them? Well, that's not a question to ask because even if you ask that, you know, the answer is there in God's word. So every instruction is given in God's word, even how to handle your finances, every area of your life, everything is there. So scripture already reveals the heart, the mind, the will, the plan, the purposes of God. All we need to ask is um, just say, God, you know, open my eyes to the wondrous things in your word. Help me to see it. Help me to understand and help me to just obey it. OK, so that is what we need to do. So when we make decisions in life, our starting point should not be people. Our starting point should be going back to the word of God. The more we are soaking ourselves in God's word, the more that we are reading God's word, the more we have confidence to know what we need to do at any stage or any problem or any setback in our um, lives or even have, when we have to make uh, choices. Okay. Now, there are times when you need to, uh, you know, you want to know what is God's will in a certain area or certain matter in your life. Then you need to uh, get into a deeper study, you know, uh, take out all the uh, uh, references on the Bible that talk about that matter, that subject, look at it in the light of the entire context of scripture, what God is saying in different uh, uh, different uh, places in God's word. And then when you begin to 
you know, put things together, when you search scripture, you will be able to know what God is telling you, directing you, and God will speak to you. And then you can make your decisions based on God's word and you will see yourself coming victorious and you will find answers for your um, uh, uh, situations that you are going through in life. Okay, so the first thing is instruction in God's word. Second thing is a quickened word. Now, for example, you're seeking guidance um, uh, for some area in your life, uh, you know, and God just speaks to you through uh, the quickening of his written word. And it can happen in different ways. Now, for example, you're praying about a certain decision in your life and um, uh, when you're reading a passage of scripture, you know, um, that addresses your matter directly, you know, God's will becomes very clear to you. So maybe you're just uh, going about reading your everyday Bible passage reading and that specific passage, that specific, uh, the son just, you know, brings about uh, uh, or guides you or leads you or gives you the answer for what you were um, looking at. Okay. So, um, you know, when you're just reading scripture, um, you know, uh, you're reading a familiar passage, you've read it many times, but this time it comes with a fresh revelation, a fresh understanding. And God is saying, hey, you're going through the situation. This is what I want you to or do or this is the answer or this is how this is a strategy you need to uh, use and you're saying hey you know i've read this passage so many times and this didn't occur to me well you are now in that situation and god is speaking to you through that situation or sometimes you're just reading a scripture passage you're hearing someone else read the passage um you know and suddenly just to a word from that 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 passage just leaps at you, just jumps at you, just hits you in the face, you know, or in your mind. And it's like a rhema word that just comes upon you and say, hey, this is the answer for my problem, for my uh, difficulty. So, you know, when we read God's word, we must, like the psalmist says in Psalm 119, verse 18, say, God, I'm reading your word. Just open my eyes to the wondrous things in your word and open my eyes to something wonderful in your um, word okay so it just this passage just leaps at uh, you and you just receive this confidence and this strength i remember that you know when uh, when god called me to go to bible college and um, it was a very difficult phase in my life um, to make this decision it was not something that um, uh, you know my dad was really um, uh, willing to take on and you know um, think i was doing the right thing um and it was a struggle. I didn't know where I'm going to get my finances, who's going to pay my fees and everything. I was just very young at that time, just, just straight out of 12th grade, you know, and, um, um, and I was not this holy person and all of those things. But I used to read my Bible, just pray. But um, when I read, when I was reading the, my Bible and I was going through all the struggle about, you know, going to Bible college, who's going to pay my fees, how I'm going to take care of things and everything. Uh, I, this, this passage that in this verse that came to me was he who called you is faithful and he will do it for you. You know, that just leapt out of scripture and just took such a hold of me, kind of you know, just blanketed me, just covered me, covered my mind, my emotions, and just gave me such a peace. And God is saying, you know, I called you. It's just the words were so perfect. He who called you is faithful and he will do it. I, I don't think any other better words could have just ministered to me in that situation because it was God who called me and God saying, hey, I'm faithful and I will do it. You know, I will do everything that concerns you. And I, that is something uh, I received in the, you know, when I just was going to Bible college in the 1990s and I just held on to it for so many decades of my life now. And times when I when I go through situations and I don't know what is, you know, what hap going to happen, this promise comes back to my life. God is saying, you know, I called you, I'm faithful and I will do it. All you need to do is just trust um, me. So sometimes, you know, these verses just come leaping at you, jumping at you. There's the, the numerous times when, you know, things like this have just happened. And I'm just going through a, a phase in my life where I'm just inquiring of God about so many things. And it's just these verses that just coming out and, you know, words just keep leaping at, at me. And I know that I'm receiving my answers and God is just speaking uh, through me. And that is so powerful and so uh, wonderful. Um, so, you know, um, 
God can speak through uh, verses like this. Also, there are times when we go about our daily routine and, uh, you know, something shocks us, something comes in our way, we don't know what to do. And the Holy Spirit quickens scripture and brings scripture to our mind because, you know, uh, Jesus says the Holy Spirit will bring back to remembrance what the Lord has um, taught you. Okay, um, I'll just share an example. Uh, I think it's a, a year or two back, you know, I had gone, I was very unwell and I'd gone to the doctor and I was advised a scan. And when I went to the scanning room, the doctor was rolling that machine over my, uh, you know, my, my abdomen. And he seemed to be very, very concerned and he kept rolling it and rolling it and rolling it and his face was very concerned so I I asked him is there anything concerning he said yes you know we can't find this and so I was too shocked when he said it and um, but I sense an amazing peace of God and um, you know um, um, I um, he said uh, did you know about it I said no he says how can you not know and he was so mad and he was you know he was I mean I knew he was quite upset and he was taken aback he said how could you not know about it and blah blah you didn't go through this you didn't go through that and all of those things I didn't tell him anything I was just quiet and I was too shocked but I just had this amazing peace of God that just blanketed me like you know, like a warm blanket. And I stepped out of that room and I was actually smiling and the nurse came running to see if I was okay because they'd given me something that was quite shocking to take and hold for my life. And uh, and I'm just walking and I, you know, I'm just smiling and I say, God, I don't know what to do now. And immediately uh, God's just speaking to me. He says, you know, I am your portion. Just this word, just, you know, this verse from scripture says, God saying, I am your portion. And then God is reminding me about uh, the storm, you know, when the the, uh, the disciples were in the boat, the storm. And what does Jesus uh, uh, do? He uh, he gets up and he just, you, you know, tells us uh, the wind and the waves, shh, be still, you know, and there was perfect peace. And I just felt God saying, shh be still and there was such calmness and such peace and I understood uh, I mean I've read the story so many times I've narrated the story so many times to children but that time it just brought that amazing revelation about I'm going through a storm and the peace of God is just so overwhelming it just kind of subdued the entire storm and there was so much of peace in my um, heart so you know, um, there are times when we go about our daily routines in life and, you know, the Holy Spirit just ministers and ministers so powerfully to us and it's just nothing but, you know, God just working in our lives. Sorry, I didn't want to stop with, um, I wanted to finish narrating the the the, the my testimony. So uh, I've taken two more uh, minutes of extra time for our tea time. Uh, we'll meet at 10.02. I'll give you two, two minutes extra. Okay, so we'll stop here. We'll come back after our break. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. See you after the break.